Hi, I'm Tom Lydon, editor of ETF Trends here in Chicago at the Morningstar ETF Invest Conference. And I'm here with Martin Kremensen, who is the Managing Director of Deutsche Asset and Wealth Management. Martin, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate morning, it. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, good morning. Listen, let's talk about hedge currency investing. I know it's near and dear to your heart, and you folks have a lot going on in that space. Give us kind of the, the, the initial premise about the strategy regarding hedge currency. Absolutely. So, um, really, all investors should be moving away from the home country bias. They've been doing it over the last few years and investing internationally. When you invest internationally, you end up taking on two positions. You take a position in that international asset, say an equity, uh, but you're also taking on a position in that currency. Now, <clears throat> over the last 10 years, certainly up until around the end of 2011, this was a great way for investors to invest internationally. The dollar was in a secular declining market, and they did very, very well out of the decline of the dollar versus those foreign currencies. Um, however, with the direction of the dollar less certain, and indeed many people predicting a strengthening of the dollar, investors need to now think about how the currency in the, uh, that the investment is denominated in could actually affect their returns. So we brought out a series of currency hedged international equity funds to enable investors to really manage the currency exposure that's coming from those international equity investments. Right, right. And, and you have some great investment tips for advisors that are allocating overseas and saying, hey, at least from a currency standpoint, you have to start from a 50-50 approach. Explain that. That's right. So, you know, as I said, investors have been moving overseas. Up until the last year or two, they've only really had one way to do it, and that was to buy unhedged products. So I want to go invest overseas. I have to take the currency exposure. Now, with the ability of them to use currency hedged or unhedged, they can start at a 50-50 perspective. They say, right, I like, I like Germany. I want to invest in Germany. Um, so I'm going to invest. I start off 50% in a hedged product and 50% unhedged, and then I say, right, do I like the euro? If I like the euro, I actually go 100% unhedged. If I don't like the euro, I go 100% hedged. But you're now giving them the ability to say whether or not they want to take that exposure. But they should always start from that 50-50 perspective on a currency neutral so they can really analyze the equity and then decide secondarily whether or not they want to take that currency exposure. Do you think the average advisor doesn't take currency into account as much when they're investing globally? And, and how devastating or how much can an advantage currency exposure be? Well, so I think up until now, they haven't really had the ability to take currency into account. It's just been, I want to invest in Japan, I have to take the end. Now they've got that choice, and I think Japan is actually a very good example here. You know, I think year to date, if you invested in Japan without hedging out the yen exposure, you made about 20%. It's a good return. If you did it whilst hedging out the currency exposure, you made closer to 40%. The, the currency can have a huge effect on returns. And just to give you an example, uh, of furthermore, the dollar versus G6 developed market currencies, in the 10 years from 2001 to 2011, it declined about 40%. It declined nearly 7% a year. And that's a huge headwind uh, if that's going against you. And so really, it can have a huge effect on returns. And advisors really do need to start looking at the currency impact on their portfolio. Absolutely. And you have a Japan product that's do, been able yeah. to take advantage of that. Yeah, DBJP is it's probably it's one of the best performing international equity ETFs year to date. Uh, it's done extremely well um, for, for investors. I think it's up maybe 40% or so year to date. Now, Europe, Germany, you feel that there's some great opportunities there as well. Yeah, I mean, we, when you look at um, the global economy and you look at Europe now, Europe seems to be pulling itself out of this, this long funk that it was in. Uh, and if Europe's going to do well, what is the engine of Europe? It is Germany. Uh, and you look at the, the German companies in, in the MSCI or the DAX, or these, it's Siemens, it's BMW, it's very, very strong companies that sell high quality goods. Um, and so we think, you know, if you're playing on a global recovery, you should look to Germany. But then you look at the euro, and at 134 or so at the moment, it looks very, very expensive. And a lot of Wall Street forecasters have the euro going down to somewhere around 120 over the next year. And some of them even have it going down almost to par with the dollar within two to three years. Um, and again, if you're going to take that investment in Germany and you haven't hedged out the currency, that's a massive headwind against your returns. I mean, basically, your equity has to perform at least 10% positive for you to even come out flat if the euro is going to decline like that. Excellent point. Before I let you go, let's shift gears and talk fixed income. Sure. You've got some recent focus in the Muni area. Touch base on that spot for a second. Yeah, so we, we brought out a product, uh, the ticket's RVNU, and, it's, uh, and, and that's supposed to be revenue, right? The, the investment is in infrastructure-backed revenue bonds. A lot of investors want munis, and they want it for two reasons. One is a tax efficiency, the other one is safety. Um, but a lot of investors are worried about you know, unfunded pension liabilities and kind of state-level risk. Yeah. So what we did is we looked at the muni world and we stripped out 
all of the investments that were not backed by revenue bonds, all of the bonds that were not backed by revenue generating infrastructure projects. Right. So these are airports, they're toll roads, they're, they're projects that actually generate the money that pays off the coupon. The other thing we did is we stripped out anything with an issue size of less than $100 million. So what you've actually got is a very, very liquid, transparent basket where every single issue is actually backed by a revenue stream. And so we think this is a, going to be a good investment for, for advisors. And we're starting to see a lot of interest in it from the people that really picked it apart and kind of understand what is actually going into it. Sure, especially with what went on in Detroit that kind of set ripples through the industry. But in this case, you're able to strip that area out, correct? Exactly. I mean, so, so no one had to ask us, what is my Detroit exposure? Because they know it's not there. In fact, there was some. It was in the, in the sewer and the water, right, which is backed and is separate from the bankruptcy. And so, you know, we expect that to be a, you know, a continual theme. If you see more state uh, bankruptcies or city bankruptcies, uh, people look at, what is in my muni portfolio? Well, with RVNU, you know it's always backed by revenue-generating projects that are generally uh, distinct from the, the bankruptcies that will happen. Absolutely. Martin, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.